Uh, it's good to be here today. We'll do a quick 15-minute review on what we looked over last week. For those who were not here, uh, we'll go kind of quick. And we're going to make uh, everything available uh, to you. Uh, if you need a printout, maybe you're not uh, computer savvy and you need a printout, we'll provide that for you. Just let us know. Request that and we'll get that done. Um, uh, I'll have it on PowerPoint. I can send it to you by email, put it on the disk for you. Um, however that is, if you don't have the Microsoft uh, uh, Office stuff, I can put it to PDF. and uh, So you can use it on PDF. So whatever format that uh, that you're familiar with, uh, we're going to make sure that you have this information available uh, so you can share it with other people. This is not my information. This is information I'm just sharing. Okay. All right. So what we went over last week uh, was quite uh, amazing. Uh, I think some people went away shocked. Some people went away and said they dreamed about it all that night. Uh, I was told uh, I've been in church all my life. I ain't never heard this before. And that's okay because, it's, you know, God reveals things in his own time and in his own way. And so as long as we understand that, you know, and, and what's so great about it is that he chose you to hear this information. I mean, that's special to me. I mean, to, to, to why, why me? Why did he choose me? Why did he choose you to hear this information? This is some powerful information. So we're going to get started. Uh, the title of it is Negro Land, and we're going to talk about true history, the curse, and the biblical, biblical prophecies about, uh, about ourselves and what they don't want you to know. And we're going to talk about why they don't want you to know it. And it's going to get a little deep today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what the scriptures say in Revelation. They say there's a group of people out there that call themselves Jews, but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So we're going to figure out who those people are. Who are those people who are saying they are Jews, but they are not? That, that, that the Lord is warning us of that they're not the real people. All right, so we looked last week and we talked about the spirit of truth is coming. He will guide us into all truth. And so we have to be able to discern the spirit by the spirit. What spirit are we encountering? You know, what are the characteristics of the Holy Spirit versus the char- characteristics of the evil spirit? As, as church people, we should be able to be able to tell the difference by the dividing word of God. He said that our people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because we reject knowledge. He said, I'll also reject thee thou, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of, God, of thy God. I will also forgive thy children. I was in the barbershop the other week, and we began to talk about uh, a few things. And the one of the subjects that came up was that as a people, you know, it's, it's culturally now acceptable to be ignorant. It, it's okay not to know something. Matter of fact, it's cool in, some, in large segments of our society to not know. And so if you even advance to know, you'll be considered an outcast. You'll be considered somebody who, who, uh, who is not even black because you want to know something. I, I just want us to see how far we've come you know, from, from our base uh, that we don't want to know. But the Lord is telling us something different. So what spirit is that then that's telling us not to know? All right. And so we went over some truths and fictions in the Bible, some sayings that uh, we, uh, some of us thought that were in the Bible, but not in the Bible. I won't go over all of those. Uh, but I, what I really want to just get into is, 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 the, is the meat of what we talked about last week. Cover it real quickly. I'm going to try to get it on, on, on recording so we, when you get to whatever format you want, you also have recording to go along with it and you, and you can follow along. Now, in the Zonovan Bible Dictionary, uh, this really stood out to me. It said that Ham, the youngest son of Noah, the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and the Canaanites. Now, that was a huge statement for me because it said a whole lot uh, in that one small statement. Number one, how do they know that we're not, if Ham is the progenitor of the dark races, how do they know that we didn't come from Ham? How do they know that? And what else are they not telling us? How do they know specifically that the Ethiopians and the Egyptians and the Libyans and the Canaanites came from Ham and were a dark-skinned people, but the Negroes, who are a dark-skinned people, did not? There's only three choices when we read our scripture. It's Ham, Shem, and Japheth. You come from one of those three. All right, so we went through scripture, and, uh, you know, this is the image that's been given to us of, of, of what the biblical people look like. 
we've been completely excluded in the images of Hollywood of who we are. And there's a purpose for that. All right? And so every time you see something, you don't see us. We, you, know, you, you wonder, where are we? Okay? We, we think about Moses. This is the image that we have in our mind. And so we looked at the, at the three sons of Ham, and uh, well, the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizram, Foot and Canaan. Because we just read the definition that said that he, he's the progenitor of the dark races. So all these people are dark people. And so when you go to the scripture, you look up Ham, Cush, Mizram, Foot and Canaan. This is the whole of Egypt right here when you begin to look at it. And then, of course, Canaan, which was uh, in Israel. So Cush means black. Uh, he's, the, he's the grandson of Noah, but he was black. His definition by name means black. So I'm going to go kind of quick because we went over this last week. Uh, you know, God asks us, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard change his spots? So if you were Ethiopian then and you were dark skinned, you're Ethiopian now and you're very dark skinned. All right. So we went over some truths and, and uh, fictions about the Bible and uh, looked at those things. So the question is, what, why does black history always stop at slavery? I've been going to black history programs all my life. And we never got past Harriet Tubman. Y'all ever thought about that? We didn't exist till, till they brought us over here as slaves. We didn't exist. And so uh, you got to know that there's something wrong with that. So who are we? Are we under curse? Why are we the most hated people in the world? Who is the synagogue of Satan? And prove that some of us are serving another Jesus. And that's going to be next week. We're going to get into, are you serving another Jesus? Paul warns us that there's another Jesus out there. And he warned the church that, that many of us are going to be infiltrated by this other Jesus, and we're not going to even know it. And I'm going to show you the evidence that many of us got the other Jesus in our homes and don't even know about it. Don't even realize. We propagate the other Jesus as if he's the real one. Now, if I were you, I'd want to know that. All right, so we went back to the 1700s map of Negro land, of Guinea. They, got, they took the names of a lot of these places and they changed the names so you wouldn't know, be able to trace this back. That's why we went from uh, Negro to color. And from color to black because of the definition of what a Negro really is. Okay? I asked last week if, if, you, know, if you want to leave now and stay in the dark, you can stay in the dark. It's your choice. But if you go any further, you can never go back to who you were before. All right. I'm going to keep going. These were the definitions of uh, who the sons of Ham were. We know they were all dark skinned people. Uh, we found uh, on a map that Babel, the Tower of Babel, they tell you that it was in, uh, in uh, Iraq, but the Tower of Babel was actually in Africa before the children dispersed, and it was found on one of the old maps down in Africa, over to your right, to the east. So we know that the Tower of Babel was built there. From there that God uh, confounded the languages and the people began to disperse all over the world. Okay. Now we had eyewitness testimony uh, from uh, white historians, Herodotus Siculus. Uh, they call Herodotus the father of history. He went down into Egypt and he described the people as black. Uh, they described them as black with heat, black skin with woolly hair, uh, black-footed ones, black limbs. So... Like I said, you'll, be, you'll have these slides available to you. But this is how the, they describe the Egyptians. This is how they drew the Egyptians or made uh, images of the Egyptians. This is ancient art. This is second century before Christ. This is another one. So they knew what the ancient Egyptians looked like. Okay, other, other historians and writers, uh, George Mashie said, The dignity is so ancient that the insignia of the pharaoh evidently belonged to the time when Egyptians wore nothing but the girl of the Negro. So all historians, any legitimate historians know that the ancient Egyptians were dark-skinned people. There's no, there's no argument about that. And so uh, the ancient Egyptians were true Negroes of the same type as all native-born Americans. Now, I got this text from... Uh, from Volney, and at the time, he thought that the Egyptians and the Negroes were the same people. This is before proof came out that these were two different groups of people, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, these are self-portraits of the real Egyptians. This is how they drew themselves. They drew themselves as a dark-skinned race of people. Uh, you, when you go to the caves of the, of the, of the Egyptians and stuff, 
the ones that they allow you to tour, they tried to wipe the cave down and lighten up the skin of the ones on the cave. They didn't want you to know who they really were. This is a, uh, we looked at this, uh, this is a mummy that they found in Egypt. They dug it up. You can look at the hair and you can tell this was a dark skinned African woman. All right, another mummy close up. Look at the hair on that. Okay, so we know that the Egyptians were a dark skinned race of people. This is Queen Tia. Uh, this is the 18th dynasty king, um, Amenhotep III. Uh, this is another 18th dynasty Egyptian uh, art. So this is how they saw themselves. But we went from that to this. All right, these are the figurines of how they saw themselves. So that's quite amazing, isn't it? Have you ever seen that before? Is it in the history book? Did they teach you that in school? All right, so there's an agenda. All right. All right, so we go back to this original definition. That the youngest son of Noah, the progenitor of the dark races, but not the Negro. So where did the Negro come from? All right, well, let's move on. Let's look at the next one that came out of the boat was Shem. And so he had five sons. And we looked at each one of these, Elam. He was black. We looked at uh, ancient pictures. You can look at their hair and see that they got cornrows. All right. In order for a white man to have cornrows, this is what he had to do. Okay. All right, this is Shem's son, Asher, where the Assyrians came out of. So the ancient Assyrians were black. Uh, this is his son, Lud. He was black. And this is his other son, Aram. He was black. Well, there's one more. There's Abraham. So out of Abraham came the Israelites. Okay, well, let's look at him. And that, now, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's Abraham's wife bare him no children, and she had, she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So he married... Here he is, a dark-skinned man, married another dark-skinned woman because the Egyptians are a dark race people. We just read the definition that Ham is the progenitor of the dark races, the Egyptians. So now we know that Abraham's wife was black. All right? Then we see Joseph. Joseph was given an Egyptian woman as his wife. Okay? All right? So we see a picture of Joseph here from a coin that they found, uh, archaeologists found, and they got him painted as a black man. All right. Uh, Moses come along. And he marries uh, an Ethiopian woman. Yeah, I remember Miriam got mad at him because he married an Ethiopian woman. She wasn't mad because he married a black woman because he was black. She was upset because she was a different people. Okay. They were Hebrews. They were Ethiopians. Yeah. Why didn't you marry another Hebrew woman? All right. All right. Once again, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Now, how does God feel about us? He said, "Are ye not as the children of Ethiopians are to me?" In other words, He said, "You look like the Ethiopians to me." Can the Ethiopian change his? Okay. Okay. All right. So when Joseph's brothers came to him and he was king in Egypt, and they began to have a conversation, they didn't recognize him. Why? Because he looked like one of the Egyptians. You know, Jesus himself went, went and went down into Egypt to hide. Why? Because he looked like him. If he was white baby, how could he go among black people and hide? You, can, you can't do it. They, the, the Romans would have came down there and they would have said, hey, have y'all seen a white baby down here in Egypt? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's him. And that would have been easy, right? You go among those who look like you in order to hide. Okay. And so we looked at that. Uh, when Moses went to deliver... Uh, it was seven maidens from, from uh, uh, some people who were trying to take their water and all that from their flock. They went back and told their dad, hey, an Egyptian, he came and helped us out. So when they looked at Moses, he looked like an Egyptian. He wasn't dressed like an Egyptian because he was running from an Egyptian because they were trying to kill him. Why was he dressed like an Egyptian? But he looked like one. All right? Uh, one of the authorities that, uh, uh, that Moses had was... Uh, when he went to deliver the children of Israel was the authority to heal from leprosy and the authority to turn his staff into a serpent. And so he put his hand in his bosom and he brought it out and his hand was leprous or white as snow. It was just white. The skin would turn white. That's what lepers in the Bible mean. Your skin would turn white. But then he put it back in and his, his skin turned back to what it originally was. And if his hand was already white, 
just think about it. He got a white hand, and he put his hand in his bosom, and then he take it back out, and his hand's still white. That's not amazing. You're not going to convince me to go try to deliver a whole group of people because my hand stayed the same color that it was when I put it in my bosom. All right? Now, proof of this is, uh, is, is when Moses' sister, uh, Miriam, uh, talked against Moses for marrying the Ethiopian woman, and, and God turned her leprous. So her skin turned white as snow. And this is uh, modern-day leprosy right here, a black man turning white. All right, so you can go to the book of Leviticus. It, it explains and defines what leprosy is. Not a whole bunch of sores or anything like that. Just simply your skin turning from black to white. What about Job? Job said, my skin is black up on me and my bones are burned with heat. Well, that ain't really what he means. Is he really meant my skin is white up on me and burned with heat. That's what he means. No, the scripture is clear. He said, my skin is black. Listen, the reason I do that is because I want us to get it in our head. We have been brainwashed all our lives. And this is just, this is just shaking somebody up right now. I can't believe it. This has been in the Bible the whole time. Yes, it's in the scripture. My skin is black upon me. This is Job. He's a Hebrew. Solomon, the, the Solomon's wife, the Shulamite. She said, I am black, but comely. Well, that ain't what you mean. Then verse 6, look not upon me because I am black. Because the sun... Has looked up on me. Now she's equating her blackness to what the sun does. So it's obvious she's talking about her complexion. All right. How did Jeremiah describe Judah? He said their visage is blacker than what? Coal. Lamentations, our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. At this time, the Babylonians had come in and they were under siege and they couldn't eat and they had a famine and, and, and when black people uh, are, are starving or whatever their skin get even darker than what it was when, they, when we thirst our skin get even darker so that's what Jeremiah was describing alright even King David was ruddy uh, a lot of people say well he was ruddy that means he was white that ain't what it means alright so we looked at the definition of what, uh, what red means and we know that it's a red light crimson is like the one on the right side. So he was a lighter skin version. He, he was a shade lighter than most of the other Hebrews. All right. When King Agrippa went to talk to Paul, Paul was in captivity by, by them. And he wanted a, his, his date before King Agrippa. And when King Agrippa saw him, uh, Paul began to talk, uh, talk in the Greek. And so it, it threw Agrippa. And he said, man, I thought you were that Egyptian. Because he saw Paul and his appearance, and Paul was of a dark, was dark skin, and so he automatically thought that Paul was one of the Egyptians that they were looking for to, to try to put in jail. He thought that was, Paul was that guy. Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, and Benjamin and Joseph had the same mother and father. All right, this is Israel's, um, images of Israel in Egyptian captivity. You can see the dude on the right or left over here had a little fro. But they were all dark-skinned people. All right, this is images of Israelites in the Syrian captivity when the Assyrians came in in 700 uh, B.C. and captured them. Here's a close-up. As you can see, they got cornrows. Uh, these are the Israelite musicians when they went into captivity. As you can see, they got locks or what you call dreadlocks. So this is how they drew themselves back then. All right. All right. This is Nahum the prophet. He was remembered as a black man. Jeremiah or Ezra. They don't know which one it is, but of course you can see the fraud of him. He's a black man. Uh, well, what happened to him? God began to scatter them because of their disobedience throughout the whole world, just like he had prophesied. And so, it, you know, our people have been in captivity from uh, since 1500 B.C. We've been in and out of captivity because he said we are a stiff-necked, hard-headed group of people. He loves us. He's crazy about us, but he said, boy, y'all some hard-headed folk. So we've been with the, from Egyptian captivity to Assyrian captivity to Babylonian captivity, Persian captivity. Uh, you know, And so the Persians let us go back and build a temple and all that this stuff. And then we were conquered by the Romans, and the Romans were here at the time of Jesus. And Jeremiah said, were we born to be slaves? Because that's all he saw. He just saw, he said, well, we're born to be in slavery. 
All right. Uh, it was a Roman historian uh, who lived at the same time that John, who wrote uh, the Gospel of John, 1, 2, and 3 John, Book of Revelation, lived at the same time that he did. He said that he thought that the Hebrews were a race of Ethiopians. Think about that. This was at the time, this was 50 years after Christ, this man saying that we have concluded that the Hebrews are a race of Ethiopians. Just because of the way they looked, they thought they were the same people. All right. Once again, can the Ethiopian change his skin? All right. Uh, about 200 years after Christ had come, uh, the Roman uh, kingdom had begun to crumble a little bit, and there was a black man by the name of uh, uh, Septimus Severus, and he was a strong uh, general in the army of the Romans, and as 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 the, as the uh, uh, kingdom began to crumble, he went and he conquered uh, areas in Europe. And between him and his son, they began to rule Europe. What set up what we call now uh, the Dark Ages. Because from about 600 A.D. to 1600 A.D., the reason they call it the Dark Ages is because then they say, well, we lost all the history. We don't know what was going on during that time. That's not true. What happened was there was a whole lot of uh, uh, black people ruling Europe at that time. Many of them were Canaanites, some of them were Hebrews. And so that part of history got whitewashed and thrown out, and they don't want to talk about it. But if you go back and you look at the, uh, at the family crest and all that of Europe, then you can figure out who ruled Europe at that time. And so I pulled up a whole bunch of family crests from Germany, and you see all the black people on the family crest represented they were royalty in Europe. So we got Germany, uh, Ger Germany again, uh, even the Pope. As you can see that, it was black. Belgium, Scotland, Germany, Spain, oh, and King James. King James ruled Scotland, and he ruled England. He was king over both of them. He was the one that united uh, those two. He was the one that's responsible for the Bible that you read. He included all the 66 books that's there now, but he also had another, some more stuff in there. He had many scholars, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, come together. I think it was around, what, 70 of them, 50 to 70 of them, and, and they, and all from all over the world. And they came together because they wanted to be in agreement on what the word was actually saying. And they included what we, what we call the Apocrypha today. But the Apocrypha reveals things about people that they don't want you to know. And then about 40, 50 years after, after they had beheaded King James, they took the Apocrypha out of the Bible because it held secrets. But then they told us that, well, it wasn't inspired, so we don't want y'all to read it. Don't, don't touch that. Y'all need to leave that. Don't even look at it. Don't even read it. And they took it out of the Bible, and we didn't even know it was there. But I got the original King James Version right there. The, one, uh, the original copy of uh, what was actually in the original Bible. In the original text, uh, unedited, uncorrected. So if you want to take a look at that, it's right there. Don't let anybody tell you what's inspired or what's not inspired. You discern the spirit by the spirit. If you are a true believer in Yahweh, if you're a true believer in what Jesus did, you have his spirit inside of you. You have the power to discern between good and between evil. You have the power to discern what's in that book and what's good and what's bad. You have that power. All right? Now, he warned them. He said, when you said, see Jerusalem comes with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Well, that happened. The Roman army came in and just decimated uh, the black Hebrews. They said, uh, according to Josephus, man, bodies was piled up three or four high. They were climbing over dead bodies to go kill more people. There was so much blood shed in Jerusalem and surrounding areas uh, in that short period of time that they said they didn't even bother to uh, uh, clean, clean up the body. They just left the body. They, they had no uh, thought of whether you was old or young or, or a child. They didn't care. They came in slaughtering everybody. They said the slaughter was so bad that it ended up, you know, people had to leave and, and disperse just like Jesus had warned. Now, according to this author right here, uh, you know, they were under just such uh, conflict that many of them went into Africa, Egypt, and the kingdom of Cush and Nubia uh, during this time. Now, I had to put a white guy up there because most of us still believe the white guys. We don't believe black guys. So I put the white guy up there first to convince you that this might be true. Okay. All right. Now, 
I mean, we've been brainwashed like that. We won't listen to each other. We won't talk to each other. That Negro can't tell me nothing. Y'all know how we do. Now, come on. Be honest. All right, but this is another author, Babylon Timbuktu. He said that up to one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing from Roman persecution. Ended up in Africa, and you know where the, where the slave trade started, right? In Africa. It was reports that Negroes were annually brought down the Nile River in this time. 3,000 Negroes annually were brought down the Nile River into Egypt. From that time all the way up into the 1800s. It's estimated over 10 million Hebrews were brought into slavery into, into Egypt. And we're not even talking about the freed, freed Hebrews that went and settled off in the West Africa. So this is where we get back to Negro land. And there's some clues in this map of Negro land when you begin to look at it. You know, if you, if you, if you studied your Bible just a little bit, you know there's 12 tribes, right? You know that Jesus came from the tribe of what? Judah. Judah. All right, so let's look at this. When you do a close-up of that, on the slave coast where they took most of the slaves from, what's the name of it? The kingdom of what? Judah. Judah. Now, right beside it is the kingdom of ben- Benin, which is Benjamin, which is Joseph's brother. Which makes sense because Benjamin has settled in, in, uh, in, in Judea with Judah. So they were living side by side. Okay. And then we look at, uh, let's look at the slave trade. You know, I put this scripture up there because the common name for, for God is Yah. You know, like I said last week, you know, there's dispute whether, you know, it's Yahuda or Yahawa. You know, we can get into the semantics of it. But Yah is is commonly agreed on by everybody that studies the word that that's his name, Yah. That's one of his names, Yah. Okay, so when you hear me say Yah, is in the scripture. So I thought his name was Jehovah. There's no J. They didn't introduce the J until about two or three hundred years ago. Y'all, y'all with me? So the word Jesus didn't exist until two or three hundred years ago. So if you get mad because somebody don't want to say Jesus, understand it's only been said for two or three hundred years that they were saying something else for seventeen hundred years before they said Jesus. I just want us to understand that. All right, Yeshua is his name because there's no J. There's a Y sign. All right. Well, why is that important? Because Yah, in order to identify his people, always put his name in their name. And so we went to the slave ships, uh, and, and we began to pull up names. Like you look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Elijah was Elijah, Isaiah was Yeshaya. You know, so Obadiah was Ob, uh, Ob, Obaya. You know, Nehemiah was Nehemiah. All of these had Yah's name in their name to identify them as He is. Okay, so we went to the slave manifestos. Let me just get down to the slave manifestos if I can find it. it. Must be out of order. I'll show you in a minute. No, I'm gonna find that. There it is. All right. So I pull up names on slaveoriges.org. It's an organization that's trying to put all the names, you know, put some dignity to the names of the slaves that were on that ship. And so they got all the they they get they collect as much uh, data as they can from the old files, and they put the actual names of the people, what ship they came over on, what year they came over on, what their actual name was before they had to change it to Toby. All right, and so I pulled it up. So I pulled up about a thousand names that look at it had the name of Yah in their name. So only God's people has the name of Yah in their name. So I just wanted you to see that. All right. So let's look at some other things. This this did it for me, kind of, you know, when I was studying this, uh, you know, because we had said that, that, that the Negroes didn't come from Ham. And so there has to be some difference between Ham and Shem, right? Genetically, there's got to be something different. And so uh, they began to, uh, to study uh, the skin pigmentation against what they call this cranial uh, information that we had looked at last week. And they recognized that even though you have the same skin, your cranium is different. And that you can recognize a people by their cranium 
uh, up to 95% accuracy of where they come from. This, this is huge, 95% accuracy of where they come from. And then this is saying that just because you have dark skin doesn't mean you're a Negro. That you could actually be a dark-skinned caucasoid. I'm, I'm putting science out there with you now because I want you, you know, some people don't believe in that. But science, uh, you know, once you throw science out there like that, then, you know, you got another argument that you got to put up, right? All right, so you can be, so they're saying that the Hamitic and the Ethiopian people and the Arabic people are dark-skinned caucasoids. So that tells me that the, a lot of white people came from Ham. And they started off dark. All right. All right. In the black image in the white mind, I got that book here. And in the cranium, Egyptiaca, Egyptiaca, they were doing a study in the 1800s trying to figure out where black people came from. And up until that point, they said that the Egyptians and the, and the Negro were the same people. And so they went back and they and they got together. They they on this thing, these two men got together on this. Uh, one was a, a one was studied skulls, and the other one was a, a Egyptologist or whatever historian or whatever. But anyway, they got together, and he pulled out 150 skulls of the servants that were in Egypt and uh, people who were in charge in Egypt, all dark-skinned people, and they came to a conclusion. And he said, he said. The information about, they wanted to go with the information about the racial significance of the inscription. So in Crania Egyptiaca, published in 1844, Morton pointed out that both the cranial and archaeological evidence showed that the Egyptians were not Negroes. Because the Egyptians came from Ham, right? As abolition and colonization had maintained, and that in fact blacks had been relegated to the same servile position in ancient Egypt as in modern. America. What does that mean? That means that the same people who were slaves in Egypt are the same people who were slaves in America. The exact same people. And then in the other book, he said Negroes were numerous in Egypt, but their social position in ancient times was the same that it, that it now is, that of servants and of slaves. We've been slaves for a long time. All right, and I put sources up here, so when I give you, if you need a printout or whatever format you tell, you have sources that you can go study and look at. In each one of those books, there's sources in the back that you can go and find other books that's going to tell you the same thing. It's a never-ending story. All right, the next piece of evidence we talked about last week was the DNA evidence. Okay, because they're different people, now it's easier to identify them genetically. And so, uh, you know, when you go and, te and test an Egyptian, a black Egyptian, and you test uh, the black West Africans, they have two different sets of DNA. And so it's been proven that the ones with the uh, E1B1A or E3A or EB3AA uh, from their father is a direct descendant of the Hebrew. Now, you, you, you know, the woman might be too, but you can't tell it because she doesn't have a Y chromosome. So there are people who are Hebrew descendants, they don't have this Y chromosome because, you know, the white man infiltrated some of our camps and even though the mother would be Hebrew you can only chase, you can only track that white man's Y DNA all the way back. You can't trace the father. Y'all get what I'm saying? So we got a lot of Hebrews that may not have this Y haplotype, but what this, the purpose of this is, is to show you that the Y haplotype, if, if, if your line wasn't infiltrated on your father's side, you can trace it all the way back to being a Hebrew. So I got mine tested, and of course I was E1B1A from the tribe, well, from Hebrew, most likely the tribe of Judah. They say either Judah or Ephraim. All right. So this was the slave trade. This is where they took most of the slaves from and disperses all over the world, just like scripture said it would. All right, let me move on. We talked about the skulls. Now we look at biblical uh, proof. Where did God say he was going to gather his people from when he came back? He said he was going to gather them from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, 
and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. So when you look at the definition of, of those names, most of those names, or at least half of them, are in Africa. So when he comes to gather his people, he's gathering at least half of them from Africa. Well, ain't that amazing? All right. Then he says, also he's going to gather them in verse 10 from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my supplements, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. So he's also going down deep into Ethiopia, not the modern day Ethiopia, but biblical Ethiopia was more down south, down the river of the Nile. Okay. Then he talks about his children, Judah, who has been dispersed all over the world. Judah has been dispersed more than any other tribe there is. Judah was where the slave coast was. Judah is the tribe that praises. His, his name means praise. So when you see Judah, you ought to see her singing and dancing and playing music and having choirs and stuff. Where do you see that at? That's what we do, right? Because most of us are from Judah. All right. I won't get into that one. The return of the Messiah. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come with, which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria. And where? And the outcasts in the land of Egypt. That's Africa. So when he blows the trumpet, he's getting ready to gather them up. He specifically mentions the outcasts of Egypt. All right. Uh, we talked about uh, an Egyptian, uh, not Egyptian, but an African, little African boy by 11 years old who was taken captive, him and his sister. He was 11, his sister was three years old. They were taken uh, captive as slaves. They were shipped over to the islands. Uh, him and his sister ended up being split up. Uh, you know, later on in his life, he was uh, uh, introduced to Christianity uh, by some people in Great Britain. And when he learned how to read English, then he began to uh, discuss with those people that the people that, uh, that they're talking about in the Bible were his people. Y'all, y'all, y'all didn't catch that. He said that the people that they were talking about in the Bible were his people. And so when he was freed up, uh, he, bought his, he ended up buying his freedom later on in his life. He wrote a book about it. And uh, so they ended up finding the tribe in Africa that he was from. And they did research on it, and these people were the Igbo tribe, and they were doing everything that the Hebrew people would do as far as their traditions and stuff. Circumcision on the eighth day. All the things that nobody else was doing, all the washing, all of the uh, marriage ceremonies, everything, the priests and everything. They had the whole, their whole cultural system was set up uh, just like their, you know, their culture said it should be set up. Okay? And, uh, you know, one of the guys... Uh, in a nutshell, he said, every law as stated in the Torah was being practiced by our forefathers before the advent of Christianity. In other words, he said, the Christians came down and kind of messed us up. But every, before they came down there, we were doing everything according to the law of Moses. He said, obviously, oh, we had a lot of little paganism to get in there, too. But, but that was proof of who they were. And that's how they separated themselves from the people, other people in Africa, because the other people in Africa didn't like them because they were different. They had they were they were cultured people. They were knowledgeable people. They were wise people. They had physicians. They had uh, uh, you know uh, chemists. They had all these things in their community. And the other African nations didn't like them because they were not indigenous indigenous to Africa. And so when the when the Arabs came along and then the Ashkenazi Jews came along and wanted to sell some people into slavery, they said we'll help you get them over there because they were a different people. So it wasn't black people selling black people. It was Egyptians selling Israelites. Okay. All right. And uh, we looked at the Egyptian president in 1956 when Israel was supposed to become a nation again in 1948. They asked him if he would ever uh, uh, have peace in the Middle East. And he said, the Jews will never be live here, will never be able to live here in peace because they left here black, but they came back white. They've been knowing this a long time. I know this is shocking for the first day people. Second day people shocked again. I can see the look on y'all for y'all shocking. All right. So, and then uh, uh, lastly on this part, uh, there was a group of uh, slaves who had been freed uh, from Richard Randolph. He was a cousin of Thomas Jefferson. 
And uh, when they let them go, they said these Israelites and other free African Americans worked as farmers. So they knew that these people were from Israel. They called themselves Israelites. Why don't we know? He said, even, thou, even though even thyself shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave you. He said we would stop abiding in the heritage that he gave us. He said, I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. There was a conspiracy. God allowed this cons- conspiracy to take place. In Psalms 83, read that. He said, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against the hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So their whole purpose was so you wouldn't remember even your name. And they almost succeeded. So the obvious question. If we've just proven that all of the Hebrew people were black people. We've proven through signs that the, that the Egyptians uh, slaves are the same people that are here right now. By signs. This is not speculation. So we know according to their percentages, with 95% accuracy, that the the slaves in Egypt are the same people who are now in America. We know that. We know by eyewitness testimony that from the slaves that were were brought over here and freed, their own eyewitness testimony said they are the people of the Bible. Now we know by DNA evidence that I showed you that we can prove by DNA evidence that the same people who have, were proven to be the people of the Bible have the same DNA that many of us have, and I showed you the E1B1A. So I can show you that my E1B1A goes directly to certain tribes in Africa who have been proven to be Hebrew people. See, they, they can't lie no more now. It's, it's true. The truth is coming out. It's coming out that even they starting to confess. I'm going to show you some of that here in a little bit. But let's look at Jesus. If all of the Hebrews were actually black, as proven by all the evidence that we've shown, then what color is Jesus? Did Jesus, was he birthed out of white man amongst all these black people? Well, let's look at the Bible then. The Bible tells us, he said, in the book of Daniel, he said, his body also was like the burial, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lines of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Polished brass. What does polished brass look like? <laughs> it's, it's right there. It's, it's the evidence. All you got to do is get some brass. Brass. And, and, and yeah, anybody ever had any of those lamps, those brass lamps? Oil lamps in your house? I know you. Cause we, if I, I know because we had them too. So. What would happen when you burn them? They were brass, but they they were gold good looking at first. But what would happen when the heat hit them? They would turn black. All right. So Jesus is describing himself like this. All right. In Revelation, it said uh, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Well, what does that look like? That's how he's describing himself. All right? He said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down in the ancient of days sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. What does that look like? That's unprocessed wool. I ain't talking about all them chemicals now. I ain't talking about the chemicals. That's right. That's right. If we just let our hair grow, this is what it looks like. But because we have been brainwashed and because it's not culturally acceptable in the places that we work and try to eat and feed our families, we try to do straighten our hair. All right. But this is us, right? 
Is that it? That's not wood, is it? Nowhere close. All right, let's look at then before the Renaissance. Before the whitewashing happened, what did they paint Jesus to look like? This is in Egypt. The earliest images of Jesus on the walls of the Coptic church in Egypt. What do they look like? Jesus and the disciples. Interesting. Cemetery wall in, in Rome. In Germany. This is Mary and little baby Jesus, according to their interpretation. In France, this is how they drew. Italy. That's pretty clear, ain't it? Y'all see it? Poland. Russia. So it's like everywhere they all knew. France. <laughs> Some of y'all just look shocked. <laughs> Switzerland. What is it that they knew that we don't know? Hungary. This is the oldest known Madonna in Ethiopia. What did they look like? Before the whitewashing took place. Even the Pope knows. Pope prays to a black Madonna. Now, they won't tell the, their congregations to do it because they don't want to lose their money. But when they in private, this is what they do. Well, all y'all might go to hell, but I ain't going with y'all. I'm praying to the right Jesus. Now, that's just wrong, ain't it? That's wrong. But it's all about that money. There's another one the Pope knows. That's a different image, but it's black too. I mean, if you would think that they, maybe they just trying to be culturally inclusive, well, that would mean that they would have some white ones and some black ones that they pray to. But all the ones he prayed to are black. Both of them was praying to a black Madonna. They've always known. All right. <laughs> this is one that got me, the Josephus. You know, I've read a lot of Josephus' work, but one thing I couldn't understand, I was like, now, Jesus was as impactful as we know he was. Why doesn't Josephus include more about him in his works? It just threw me, you know what I'm saying? And so until I realized what was going on, they were taking stuff out. What happened was, is this Jewish guy, Robert uh, Eisler, or Esler, he went back and he found an old Russian translation of Josephus' work, and it preserved all of the words. And so he got it trans translated. <laughs> Listen to what he said. He said, he said, at that time also there appeared a certain man of magic power. If it be meet to call him a man whose name is Jesus, who, whom certain Greeks call a son of a god, but his disciples call the true prophet he was a man of simple appearance, mature age, black skin, short growth, three cubits tall, hunchback. I don't even know what that word is. Prognathus with a long face, a long nose, eyebrows meeting above the nose, with scanty curly hair, but having a line in the middle of the, he of, of the head after the fashion of the Nazareans with an undeveloped beard. When he came out with this translation, it shook the foundation of all of these so-called theologians. And they came out against this man with everything they possibly could to keep this from getting out. And they squashed it for a while. And then uh, here lately in the past few years, people have admitted 
that he was more than likely correct. They won't say he was correct. They just say he was more than likely correct. So Jesus was ugly. Just like the scripture said, it says he was he he was he didn't look in a way that anyone should desire him. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. He appeared in such a way that 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 you would have to have something on your inside in order to meet with something on his inside. That you wouldn't judge him by how he looked on his outside because your heart would discern what was on the inside. That's the trick of the enemy today. He wants us to look on the outside. And he tells us, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You wrestling against something that's on what? The inside. Spiritual weakness is high place. So we have to learn then how to see with a different eye. Y'all, y'all realize what I'm saying? The scriptures say that the spirit has eyes. And the spirit has ears. And the spirit has his own mouth. And we have to begin to learn to listen, not with our natural ear, but with our spiritual ear. We have to begin to speak, not with our natural tongue, but with our spiritual tongue. We have to begin to see, not with our natural eye, but with the spiritual eye. So we can see what he sees, hear what he hears, know what he knows. This is where we are. We, we are in decision-making time. We are in a powerful time right now. All right? The false image. This is what we were told he looked like. Guess where that come from? Leonardo and the child of Cardinal Rodrigo Borgio by his long-term mistress, Venosa del Catanel, who would later become Pope Alexander VI. It was so close, it was believed that they were lovers. Talking about him and Leonardo da Vinci. Under the power of the Catholic Church, Pope Alexander VI decided that he would have his son, Caesar Borgia, used as a model for Jesus in paintings that was Da Vinci was commissioned to do. He used his own homosexual son to draw the image that many of us worship today. Now, I ain't saying slick. I'm going to get you to worship. The Pope wasn't even supposed to have a woman. He wasn't even supposed to. He wasn't even, but he got a woman. Wasn't his wife. A mistress. They have a son. The homosexual. Who's having an affair with Leonardo uh, da Vinci. And they said, we're going to use that to portray our God. And you're going to have a hard time. Oh, he he been he been twisting this thing up for a long time, and when I show you next week how he been twisted it up, it's gonna freak you out, really. Yes, sir. We kind of skimmed over it, but yes, sir. We talked about. Um, it, it came from several different directions. One of the main directions was leprosy. Leprosy was a curse that changed black skin to white skin. And so we showed the images of a black man being changed to uh, a white man. Then there was another scripture that uh, that's not often taught uh, when the prophet... Y'all remember when Naaman came and he, he began to... Uh, he, oh, that's what you're talking about. When Naaman... So let's get this out so because this brother bring up a good point. Naaman, uh, as you know, he was leprous. Right. And so he went to Elijah to be healed. And you remember Elijah wouldn't come out and talk to him. He was offended by all that. He told him to go wash seven times in the Jordan or whatever. And so that was one of the dirtiest rivers there was. He really didn't want to do it. And so his servant was like, man, if, if, if he had told you to do something difficult, you've been ready to do that. He said, but give it a shot. Anyway, make a long story short, he went and washed seven times, got rid of his leprosy, got his brown skin back, went back. He wanted to pay Elijah some money. Elijah wouldn't take none of his money. But Elijah's servant wanted that money. And so after Elijah turned him down, uh, the, the name rolled off. And the servant snuck up behind him in secret and said, hey, man, uh, Elijah changed his mind. <laughs> yeah, 
he wanted that money. <laughs> so he took the man's money like it was from Elijah. And when he got back, the Holy Spirit had already told Elijah what the man had done. And he cursed the man to uh, turn leprous. He said, you will be a leper and your, all your children will be a leper for the rest of eternity. So everybody after him, his all his children, no matter what, all of them were leprous people. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you bring up a good point. I'm really going to stress that here in a minute, but that's that's an excellent point that they're doing the same thing now, and you can identify. God's people, who's following God, the spirit of God, and who's following the spirit of the enemy by what they're doing right now. I'm glad, I'm glad. See, you, we, got some, we got some people in here that's on this, all right? So we go back to the original definition. Now you know what that means. Now you know that up to 70 to 80% of, of, of black people over here are Hebrew people. We know that for a fact. It's just that most black people don't know who we are. But we fit all of the biblical curses. Yeah. All right. The curse of Deuteronomy 28. So I'm glad Pastor read that. That's how you know the spirit is working. I didn't tell Pastor to read Deuteronomy 28. He just came up and read Deuteronomy 28. We hadn't discussed that I was going to talk about Deuteronomy 28 that I remember. All right. So the curse of Deuteronomy 28 fit only fit one group of people on the face of this earth. Not just, I'm talking about just one or two things. I'm talking about all of them. Anybody can fit one or two. Nobody fits all of them. Okay. Now why did he he, he said that he talks about blessings in Deuteronomy 28. He said these are the blessings that are going to come up on you as a people if you do what I tell you to do. If you be a B. He said, but if you don't, these are the curses. Y'all get it? And I, I, for years, I couldn't figure out, man. It hurt me from a little boy all the way up. I was like, Lord, are we cursed? I said, we can't get up for nothing. I said, why can't we come together, start businesses? We should have businesses all up and down Brown Ferry Street. We should have businesses all up and down High Street. We shouldn't have to go to anybody to get anything. We got people that know how to build. We got people that know how, but, but we can't come together for nothing. What is it? And it wasn't until he revealed to me who we were that I realized what was going on. And it made a whole lot of sense. It's not because just because white people hate us. It's not. It's because our forefathers disobeyed and brought these curses up on a whole group of people. And we perpetuate it today. We're still doing some of the same things today that they were doing then. And he's holding us more accountable because we are his. Every book of this Bible was written by a Hebrew, a black man. Yeah, I mean, that scripture is really referring to Messiah because he was a root. He was the root. He's the root that comes out of the dry ground. In other words, what it's saying is that uh, he was able to flourish when there was nothing to flourish from. How does a root flourish and there's no water? Y'all, y'all get what I'm saying? That, that's what he was trying to show us with Aaron's rod that budded. He took a dead stick and he said, I want y'all to put a dead stick out in front of everybody's house, the leaders of everybody's house, and when you come out the next day, whose ever stick has budded, in other words, life that comes out of something dead, that's who I chose. Y'all get what I'm saying? And so there's a picture of what the Messiah was going to do for us, that he brought, he brought life out of a dead situation. And it was the almond fruit that budded, because the almond is the first 
fruit to bud, and it buds right at the end of winter time before, while everything else is dead, it buds. And that's what Jesus did. While we were all dead in our trespasses and in our sin, all of a sudden he was the almond fruit that budded. And he brought life in the winter time when everything else was dead. But then he extended life to all of us. And he was brought up the root. Y'all got to get that's good right there. Out of dry ground. Because it takes a miracle to grow something with no water. So when you read those scriptures, that's what, that's what he's talking about. All right. Deuteronomy 28. He said, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall put upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed for how long? Forever. He said, These things are going to pursue us. It's going to be a sign. What's the sign for? So you can recognize, right? So you can recognize what time is it? Okay, I'm going to stop right here just for five minutes. I'm going to redo the uh, recording.